to be good at anything, you have to be complete. You know, and, and my goal has always been to be a complete coach. And I think the more I learned um, as a young coach, the more I knew, hey, I could be good at it. You might have a second career in podcasting. After I don't know this. about that, Drew Tranquil. I feel like I'm you follow might. in your footsteps, brother. I feel like you might. I'm just a rookie here trying to figure it out. Hey, you got one thing you have a talent for is getting people to show up. I've been able podcast. to get I've been able to get people to show up. Yes, you have. For some reason, maybe they maybe they feel guilty and they're like, "Ah, oh, let's help this guy out." Mm. Oh, espresso. How is that? Um, it's how espresso is hot. Is it hot? Is it strong? It's good. Yeah. I can't really differentiate. It's just if it's hot, I like it. So, uh, have you you've been following the playoffs? What is your uh, what's your take on the NBA playoffs so far? Do the Warriors have a chance? I know you. I, I know do you I like them. I definitely think they have a chance for sure, um, just because of their pieces and their experience, and they can score. Um, you know, they're a top five defense too. Uh, I think that's what's interesting about this matchup is a lot of people are talking about. Um, both teams, I think, score in the basketball, but both teams are top five efficiency defenses, and that's why they're where they are, um, especially Boston. I think when you – what I really respect about Boston is who they've beaten. You know, they swept the Nets with two of the best offensive players of a generation, you know, Durant and Kyrie. Then they go seven games versus the Bucks. you know, the defending world champions, and you go through that group of guys, and then they go another seven-game series versus Miami, a team that had a whole bunch of confidence, uh, won game seven on Miami's floor. Um, it's just an impressive road to get there. So they've got real chops, and they can score. They're big. They have experience. Uh, you know, they've got a good team, really. And they, they have, have a really good team. They have a really good team. I, I don't think people realize, like, how good they are. And then this Jason Tatum, you know, he's one of these young superstars that people are. I think I think everyone knew Jason was such a good player, but I think everyone realizes no, this is this is a superstar that you're watching. But they really guard you. They've got a lot of really good experience in terms of, um, you know, like Al Horford, even a guy that who had never been to the finals, but just like they got the right the right like kind of experience. Uh, that Marcus Smart, Smart guy. I mean, he's a rugged, tough player. Uh, and, and so they can, they can, they can defend Golden State, you know, Golden State's hard to keep up with, but Boston is uh, a team that can, that can defend them well enough. Uh, and then there's a power element to, to how Boston plays that I like. They have a power element to their team, which I do think gives Golden State problems. And, uh, I think they killed them on the offensive rebounds. Yep. And, and I think that that's, to me, that's always been the formula when you play against a team like Golden State is if you can bring a power element to the game, uh, you know, then, then you'll have a better chance. And I think that Boston has that, um, you know, especially on the glass because, you know, Golden State's not a big team. Which is interesting. You bring up the defensive efficiency as a smaller team. It's interesting that they were still able to crack the top five. That's, I feel like that's one of the biggest things, mm -hmm. the biggest conversations is the size advantage Boston has. Yeah. And I think that, you know, Steve is, you know, Steve Kerr, who I've gotten to know a little bit, he's talked a lot about their, their defense, um, you know, that, that sort of that evolution. Uh, and it starts with Draymond, obviously, you know, setting the, the tone, but, you know, Iguodala being a big part of that culture. And, and then they've onboarded some athletic players, you know, Andrew Wiggins and, um, you know, Jordan Poole, He's had an Gary, amazing Payton, you know, season. Gary Payton has kind of become like a defensive glue guy. They've added these cool pieces um, that I think of really, you know, like as, as the game has gotten smaller, um, what Golden State did is they onboarded some guys who can guard smaller people at a high level. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that they do well. They can match up with you um, and kind of keep Steph and, you know, out of the way. And Clay, you know, he, you know, he's a pretty good defender. What people, you know, I think Clay does a good job defending, but um, they're able to guard smaller teams because they have some pieces that they've added that, that allow them to do it. Yeah. All right. Let's shift. Let's talk about you a little bit. I want to, I typically start young and, and kind of go through somebody's story, but I think it would be really cool with you maybe to start like recently. Yeah. And I think a really interesting point that maybe doesn't get talked about enough because I know you're a family guy is you married Amy in 2011 and I'm going to read it off the thing here, but you married her when you were at Hutchinson. That's correct. 
And then since that point, you've coached at Hutchinson, Tennessee, John Carroll, James Madison, back to John Carroll, Chicago Bears, Denver Broncos, LA Rams, and now the Chargers. And so I think it would be cool for you to maybe shed some perspective a little bit on how you have a sane marriage and a sane <laughs> family life with all the change in the in the moving. I think that uh, it starts on the front end of the relationship. I think that we knew exactly um, who we wanted to be as a couple. And I think um, at the beginning, we knew what type of relationship that we wanted to have, regardless of where we were. I think she had a really good understanding of where I wanted to go uh, in my career. And I think she knew what I was going to have to do in order to get there. Like I said, hey, I may have to go on a path like this in order to go where I think I'm capable of going. So I think on the front end, we did a really good job of communicating. I was fortunate that she's a teacher and that she, you know, could be in a profession that, you know, was her passion um, and that meant so much to her where she could take that profession wherever we went as a couple. Mm. And I think that we had a really good plan um, in terms of what it was going to take to get to where we both wanted to go. Because, Drew, we we look at each other like a team. Like, it's not like, oh, well, Brandon's going to go do this thing and then I'm going to be doing that thing. It's like, no, we're a team. You know, when we, it's we got hired by the Los Angeles Chargers. We got hired by the LA Rams. We got hired by the Broncos. Like, we've always looked at it that way. And I think that that's a, I think that the, all the transition that's come with our life, it's able, we're able to attack it better because we know that we're doing it together. Um, and then I think that, uh, you know, what we've also done is we've also gotten better at it as we've gone. I think the more you transition, the better you get at it. It doesn't make it easier um, for sure because transition is so stressful moving and starting over, especially when you have kids involved. Um, but I think that what we both st started with the premise is that we're both going to live our dreams. And I think that in order to live their dreams, your dreams, there's a lot of hard work and there's a lot of tough, tough, tough challenges that are going to come your way. And, and you got to be ready to attack them together. And I think that's why we've been able to make it so far. When you were kind of negotiating that out in the, the pre phases there, did you have a timetable like where you're like, Amy, I think we can make this happen in x years like did she anticipate you moving what like eight times in in 10 years i don't don't know if there would have been those types of expectations uh yeah. we look back on it and we're we say man i'm glad we were young you know when it when it was happening but my wife has always believed in me and i've always believed in her uh and so i think she would say i knew that he could do this but she was just like how long is it going to take you know for someone to discover him and all that. And, and I think what she allowed me to do was, um, she was able, she, she, she allowed me to really put myself out there and improve and do all the things that I needed to do to invest in my game, go get the experiences that I needed in order to, to be where I am right now. And there's so many stories in that, that time frame that you mentioned that, that led me to this point. Um, and she was a part of all those stories. And, and I think mm -hmm. that something about our relationship, um, is that she, there's nothing about what goes on at the office that she doesn't know about. Like she is my best friend. She is my, you know, um, closest, you know, confidant when it comes to football. And I tell her all the things that come with my job and she's been such a big help in getting to me where I am today. And, uh, and so I feel like, like she's the assistant head coach of the chargers. Like she knows everything that's going on with, with everybody. She knows how uh, practice went an install went a game went, Hey, what my thought process is. Um, and I think that when you do it together that way and there's no, there are no secrets, then you don't have a barrier in your relationship. And I think that that's something that I've always um, loved about our relationship is that, hey, even when I'm coming home late at night during the season, like she's waiting for me and she allows me to unpack it all and then we unpack it together. And, and then that gives you the strength the next morning to go do it again and, um, because you feel like you are on the same page. And, um, you know, I'm very thankful for her. I remember you sharing that with me. I, I want to say we were at a training camp practice and you said, yeah, I got home a little late last night and Amy was still up 1130 waiting on me. She wasn't too happy about it, yeah. but she was up nonetheless. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. She's always there. Always. Um, she's not someone to go to sleep and that's just not the way we are as a couple. And what I've gotten better at as I've gotten uh, older is um, making sure that I don't create false expectations. Hey, it's better to say I'm coming home later than, you know, 
you know, too soon and then be late. So I think I've done a much better job growing as a husband of making sure that um, the expectations <laughs> are accurate. Yeah. And I think that's something that uh, I've gotten better at. But it's such a good feeling knowing you can go home and have a little time to decompress and um, to connect and hear about her day, our boys' day. And again, we've tried to create a real family atmosphere at the office, you know, with family night and having kids and, and wives at the office because um, that creates the type of balance that allows you to be as good as you can be. Have you established a rhythm for, I don't want, I want to say leaving football at the office, but how do you go home and you've got kids and a wife? How do you kind of put that aside mentally to like really be able to, to be present? Is there like a driving home routine you yeah. have or? Yeah, I think uh, one thing that we've kind of established uh, throughout our relationship is that if you have a phone call to make, make sure that it happens before you get home. Hey, mm -hmm. you got to call your twin brother on the East Coast, your dad, a friend, you know, hey, one of my best friends is defense coordinator for the Eagles. He's on the East Coast. Hey, if you've got one of those calls to make, make sure it happens before you step foot into the household. And then once you're in the household, you're in the household. That phone's gone and you're fully present with the boys. And then we get into our rhythm. You know, hey, if I come home at a certain time, like, hey, maybe it's now like in the springtime, like where, hey, we go right to dinner then we got books in bed. And then now we've got our time as a couple to connect, whatever, um, watch a show, you know, you name it. Um, but making sure that when I get home, that work doesn't come up, you know, um, in that sequence. And, and I think that that's important. And then if I do have to work from home, um, that we define when that's happening. So again, there's that expectation like, hey, sweetheart, I'm gonna be from like six to nine, I'm gonna block out this morning or hey, I'm grinding a little tape, maybe it's some draft prep, you know, whatever the case may be, free agency. But then from nine o'clock on, hey, man, that is, I'm out of that room, my phone's away, and then we go. And I think that that's the thing about relationship is that those communication of expectations and then making sure that you're not being distracted you know, and I think we talked about it this off season is like, Hey, you're not, your day isn't disrupted by a distraction that's taken mm. away from the most important thing, which is your family. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, how you got to this point as a head coach in the NFL. I see it in you a little bit. And I think I know some of the reasons why, but you talked a little bit about sharing with Amy, like, here's what I think I need to do in order to get there. Yeah. When you started out, was it Northern Illinois that was your first? It was my first college job, yeah. Yeah. So at that point, did you have any idea what the path to becoming an NFL head coach, was that your dream or was it college? I wanted to coach in the NFL. That was the level, I because I had access to the NFL, and I think that that's important. You know, our offensive coordinator, Joe Lombardi, he coached me my fifth year in college. And when Joe got hired with the Falcons um, in 06 and then went to New Orleans in 07, um, you know, I had access to the NFL and it's really when Joe went to new Orleans in 07. Um, and that was my second year in uh, coaching, uh, kind of after I, I finished my cancer stuff, but they like after, after, um, that 07 season, when he was in new Orleans, I was like, that's where I want to coach. Cause I had some access to the NFL and I just knew that that was, it was the most competitive place in the world and, and who you're playing against and what's at stake. I just, I knew that there was a different level of football, um, and, and that I felt like I was good enough to get there, you know? And, and when I get, once I got exposed to what the NFL was, was truly like, I, I knew that that's ultimately where I wanted to go. And um, I've always known I've wanted to be a head coach. Um, but I think when I had some access to the NFL, um, I think my second year in coaching is when I knew I want to go to the NFL, ultimately. What, what is that like? I got to pause a little bit. What is that like having been coached by Coach Lombardi and now you're working hand in hand with him coaching an NFL organization. Well, I think what's special about it is that um, he's been there with me from when I was a young guy um, to now and seeing that evolution and being a part of that. Uh, I think that's really special. And I think, as you know, in football, like trust is such a big part of your success. It's like one of the number one currencies. You know, we talk about relationships in our building a lot and that relationship that goes back from when I was a 21 year old, 21, 22 year old kid now being a, you know, 39 year old, you know, younger man, I think that when you have 17 years with somebody, um, that's really important. And then the, the, how we see football, uh, how we see, you know, how to run a team, 
uh, and, and being able to also compliment me. As you know, Joe is, is different than I am. And, and I really valued that. I wanted that. I wanted to make sure that I surrounded myself with people that could really compliment my strengths and weaknesses. And I think that he does that. And uh, so I think that just we're able to communicate a lot um, faster um, and a lot better for you guys. And, you know, we're in full alignment of how we want to do things. And, and that's hard to find in pro sports is that that alignment. And when you have both the alignment of football and the personal, you know, it's, it's special. And I'm, I'm very fortunate yeah. that we're together. So when you were doing the, the dirty work of a, of a GA and putting presentations together, putting scripts together, like what allowed you, I guess, to kind of keep and see the light at the end of the tunnel? I, I imagine you were kind of just picking up things along the way, but I guess if your dream was head coach, you had to be seeing everything through the lens of like, how is this going to make me a better head coach or a better potential candidate to secure a job? Yeah. I think the more I learned about the, cause I think people think about um, football and they're like, Oh, well, he's just a offensive coordinator. He's just a defensive coordinator. He just, he knows like one thing he's got a specialty. Well, that's not really what a head coach is about. A head coach is about the entire part of the game. It's offense, defense, kicking game. It's organizing sports performance. It's being a, in tune with PR, marketing, you know, social. Um, you know, it's running the entire thing, travel, logistics. Um, and as you know, uh, I think to be, a, to be good at anything, you have to be complete. You know, and, and my goal has always been to be a complete coach. And I think the more I learned um, as a young coach, the more I knew, hey, I could be good at it. You know, I played quarterback, but my entire coaching background was on defense. Hey, my former coach, you know, coached in New Orleans with the Saints, the number one offense in the league. So I kind of knew what I was going to have to def to, to defend. And was that intentional that you got into the defensive side of the ball? That like was with your quarterback. Background? That was a little bit lucky. My, I, gi I give it all credit to Joe Novak. He's, he's the guy who built Northern Illinois. Uh, he's retired now in Southport, North Carolina. He liked the fact that a quarterback could run the defensive scout team, you know, you know, that, you know, on defense, you could run the offensive scout team and you're, you're used to being in the huddle. And so, Hey, when you're having to communicate to a bunch of new people, Hey, you've already done that. You're the quarterback. So he liked that. He had had some coaches that were very successful doing that. Um, and so he liked that part of it. And so, Hey, I just did it because it was a chance to get into coaching, but, um, the reason why I think it made sense to me is I felt like coaching defensive football was a lot like playing defense in basketball. And I was a huge basketball player. That was really my first love growing up. And so I was like, you know, the fundamentals of, of playing defense are really what I know. You just have shoulder pads and helmets on and you're able to use your hands and stuff like that. And so it came very natural to me. And my dad, who was, you know, our coach growing up, he was more of a defensive coach anyway in basketball. So it just, I felt like from a strategic standpoint, Hey, this is really this is really going to make sense, and this can be mm. uh, a background that that I think is very um, unique. And a lot of the coaches that I, I've looked up to in the past w have my background. You know, Tony Dungy, he was a quarterback, and um, you know, I think that defensive coaches who had an offensive background, you know, Mike Tomlin, you know, that guy, people forget he was a receiver at William and Mary, mm. um, and I think that. Uh, you know, that, that's something that's always stood out to me is having that, that offensive background, um, and being a defensive coach, uh, being able to see it from that lens. And, uh, I think it's allowed me to be where I am today. It's interesting watching you get up in team meetings. Cause you'll talk like the quarterbacks, yeah. you like know the play calls and stuff. Yeah. Well, I think it's important. You know, it's certainly, um, it was a big goal of mine. You know, when you become the head coach is you want to be able to speak to everybody on the team and it's not just players, it's your coaches too. And, uh, and I think that I've been around a lot of good coaches, um, but hey, this is the vision for how we want to play. And if, if I don't know our offense, then I'm not going to be as good of a coach. You know, if I can communicate quickly with Corey Lindsley and Justin Herbert about how to solve a problem um, and speak that language, like our language of the Los Angeles Chargers, then I'm not going to be as good of a head coach as I can be in the same way in special teams. If I can't coach the left wing on punt like Ryan Ficken, then there's going to be a limit to my game, you know? And, and so I never wanted for that to happen. I wanted to become a, a complete coach. And, um, and again, you talk about what it takes is it's mastering a lot of systems. I think you have to build a foundation and knowledge and know how different systems work on, in all three phases. And that's what I spent a lot of time when Amy and I were first, you know, going out and like, you know, my path to get here is kind of a non-traditional path was, Hey, learn as much as you can and learning how these things work 
what works, what doesn't work. Um, so that way, when you do get your opportunity, you can build something for you and you can adjust it as you go where you don't just know one way, you know, because we both know in the NFL, like if you just have a system and it doesn't work, you know, you don't have time, you know, you got to be able to adjust as you go and build things uh, around the people that you have. And, um, and, that, and that's why I think that foundation in football is so important. How do you have like a, a mastery over all the different areas and feel like you are um, knowledgeable enough to teach it, but then also have other coaches on board and give them the freedom yeah. to like coach. Such I imagine good. on a day-to-day basis, like you're like, ah, I might've said that different than he said that, or uh, maybe I want to say something like, how do you balance like interjecting yourself first? I guess people call it micromanaging, but what, yeah. what has that been like in your first year and a half learning that's, as a head coach? I think that's such a great point. You have to onboard coaches. Um, and my criteria is character and capacity. Um, and I think that something that I made, you know, very clear in my interview process was it's so sacred to earn a player's respect and that respect should come quickly. They should know quickly that you're a good person and they should know quickly that you're an expert, right. And being a coach in that craft. And, um, and, and so, um, I wanted to make sure that I, um, onboarded coaches that, um, were, were those two things, character capacity, uh, but also that could really ha- have complementary experiences. I think on our coaching staff, we have a lot of diversity uh, on our coaching staff of not only, you know, like race, but also experiences, you know, in just terms of college background, pro background, um, experience, different experiences within a certain style of play. Like, yeah, you want people that believe in what you believe in terms of a stylistic standpoint, but then, hey, they can bring a couple things to the table that you think could you know, really help you, you know, I wanted to make sure I had former players on my staff that had played in the National Football League who could help me. You know, I've got Ronaldo Hill and Mike Wilhoy, Johnny Timu, these guys that have played and sat in the, sh- the, the, the chairs that you've sat in. I think that's really important that you have that type of lens, uh, good mix of college and pro. And then what you do is then you allow your, your coaches to shine because everybody, if you are hiring the right people, if they have pride in their performance, um, if this is the most important thing in the world to them, then they're going to shine for you. What you have to do is you got to make sure that they have the space to shine. And as you know, being on defense, you know, all of our defensive coaches are going to have an opportunity to speak to our unit. I want them to know that we've like every coach that we I love that, by the way, that is like, that's an awesome thing. Every coach that we have um, is really special. And, and, and that's how you bring people together is if you know one another. And then the other thing that I take a lot of pride in is you're hopefully in preparing people for opportunities. You know, I wouldn't have been able to become the defensive coordinator for the Rams or the head coach of the Chargers if, if Vic Fangio, one of the best defensive coaches of the last 30 years, maybe in the history of football, he didn't give me an opportunity to speak to the unit. And, uh, you know, I was able to get up in front of our defense, in front of Khalil Mack back then, uh, in front of guys like Vaughn Miller. Um, and, and it created a lot of confidence for me in my own game. And, and so that's what we're always trying to do for our coaches is create confidence in their game, you know, cause they're going to get better at it the more they do it. And so it's a two way street. And just like we're trying to develop you guys as players, you're trying to develop your coaches for opportunities because they have big goals and aspirations. Mm. And so you can do all this at the same time if you do it right. And, um, that's what I'm trying to do with the chargers. You talk about mastering the craft. What do you tell like the coaches and the people that work for you are like, two or three of the most important criteria you can have as an aspiring head coach? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I kind of use the phrase, you'll be the same person five years from now, except for the people that you meet and the books that you read. And so what I'm really trying to say is you've got to invest in your game at a high level, you know, and if you want to be a special offensive coach, then you better, better be able to invest offensively um, in learning the fundamentals, you know, the different systems, um, the different ways of, of leading an offense and running an offense. And, you know, there's a lot that goes with that, you know, cause there's scheme, there's personnel, there's fundamentals, and you want to have a foundation, um, in offensive football that isn't exclusive to like one way, you know? And I think that what I try to open everyone's eyes is, is like, you need to be studying a lot of different systems in order to be a good offensive coach. Yeah, you have to have your system that you believe in and and maybe uh, some principles that are fundamental that aren't ever going to change. But you may need to borrow something from somebody else's system or you may think of somebody 
when you're in the evaluation process, uh, watching college, you know, film, there may be something in college that really makes sense to you. You think it could really help your game out and it could be going to study a college. Um, and, and then the other thing that I'm constantly talking to our coaches about is you better be talking to your players because most of the answers that you're looking for are going to come from them in terms of who you want to be and how you want to do things. And so I really encourage our coaches to ask their guys a lot of questions and are constantly, you know, in touch with their players because most of the answers that you're looking for are going to come from them. Has there ever been a time where you ask a, a player and like totally changed your mind on something all like the time? Maybe, fundamentally maybe like, or? maybe like yesterday, you know, yeah. like maybe yesterday. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, Khalil Mack and I were having a conversation on the side yesterday talking about pass rush, you know, and talking about when we were together in 2018 and then, then I kind of left him and we kind of, you know, are watching each other from afar and uh, we're talking about, you know, kind of getting Leonard Floyd going, you know, and like, what happened with Flo? And we kind of went back and, and talked about some things. And then he's like, hey, have you ever thought about this? Mm. You know, and man, it just hit me like crazy, you know, and something small, like something small. But when you committed your whole life to something, it's normally something small that, you know, has this onset of this burst of this explosion of, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I didn't think of that. And you know, now you're going to be able to coach a guy better and I'm going to be able to coach him better. And so I think that's what my point was of, of always talking to the players because they, um, I think, have the, the lens that you're looking for. Ultimately, that's why you coach is for, for your players, not, not for anybody else. And so I've learned more from the players, I think, than any coach for sure. What'd you learn, in, in, I guess, along the same lines and in the same vein, what'd you learn most from this past season and your first season as a head coach, I imagine you talked about a little bit the head coach having the responsibility of the full organization, yeah. uh, media, logistics, travel, meals, you're working performance. And as a coordinator, I imagine you don't, you never really had your hand in that at the Rams. So what was that onboarding like for you in the first year? Even, I guess, we had added the complications of COVID For and sure. everything that brought in the off season. Looking back, what were you like, oh man, I really learned a lot. Well, I, I, I think the one thing I learned is um, you have to, you have to set the example for the mission statement of your organization every day. Like you're responsible for that. I remember having that uh, mission statement meeting. Yeah. Right and, when you got onboarded. And, and and I think that, you know, and when you say something, then you got to live up to it, you know? And so I, I thought that that was something that I took really seriously. Um, but the one thing I would say that stood out to me about the first year um, was the scheduling, like how many schedules you are responsible for and how those schedules get communicated and how they get implemented um, and what that takes um, doing everything for the first time. I think that, um, and I've said this uh, to some other people, but when you're doing everything for the first time all the time, it, it takes a lot from you. It requires a lot from you. And I think what was amazing is it brings out the best in you. But I think the amount of schedules that you do for the first time as the head coach, because like the defensive coordinator, I'd already done that job before. Like everyone's like, oh, like, you know, how was it with the Rams? I'm like, well, I'd been a defensive coordinator like over half my career in college. Like I've done that job before. Yeah, I'm doing it in the NFL and whatever. But I was like, I've already done that where I've never been the head coach. And so I think, and I've certainly never been a head coach during COVID. So the amount of schedules that you had to make for the first time, and I think what I was so um, intentional about or what I tried to give my all to was just communicating those schedules mm -hmm. and why we were making them the way that we were. Because what you want is your people to have confidence and to get rhythm and, and to, okay, I know why we're doing this. And hey, this isn't just something random. And then take ownership if you feel like you didn't do something well enough, like communicate that too. But I think from a scheduling standpoint, I was really, I, I put a ton of energy my first year into that. And I didn't, I probably had no idea that it was going to be that significant. I maybe had an idea, but just, I think going through 17 weeks of a, of a regular season, preseason, off season. Um, then when you know that, man, the minute that last game ends, then the schedule moving forward and how fast it goes. Um, I would say that uh, my first year that that was something that stood out to me is like a huge responsibility yeah. where now going into your second season, man, how much more confidence you have because you've already been through it. How do you, as a head coach, not 
uh, second guess yourself. It could be even in small decisions like, man, I should not have done that in the scheduling, but I feel like it could even carry over into like critical game decisions. Sure. And like, what is your process for handling, I guess, internally, maybe self-criticism, but even like outward criticism as well. Like, I feel like in a decision-making position, like that is, you got to be a master yeah. at that because it's ever present. And it's, it's part of your job, you know, it's, and, and you know how many people are involved in those decisions. And I think that that's never lost on me is that decision isn't just about me. It's, it in, impacts you, Jackie, your family. Um, our owner's family, our fans, you know, it, it impacts, it impacts a lot of people. And so, um, I think with that reality in mind is that you just have to pour into so much to your process. You have to pour into, um, that decision-making process that those systems that you have in place that allow you, um, to operate at a high level. And I think that that's something that I learned at a young age is pouring into being good at that and being ready for that. Um, and then, knowing that if you do that, you're able to live with the consequences a lot better. And, and then I think also, what are those systems for you? Yeah. Like personally, like, do you like just block out like the Twitter and the stuff? Do you do like, I don't know, like meditation stuff that helps you like process thoughts easier? Yeah. I, that's a good point. I, I'm not on social media and I knew that, um, like I'm aware of social media. I, I definitely, um, have a presence in terms of understanding the value and importance of it. But I think that to, to, to say that I'm on it and consumed with it. And, um, I think that what I try to do is get briefed by a lot of people about what's out there and what's happening. I think that's important that you do know what's out there and what's happening. Yeah, you have to know what's going on. You have to know what's going on. You can't just be, you know, like this person that's like in a bubble or oblivious to what's happening. I've never been that way. Cause I love ball too much. I love, you know, learning about things too much, but I do think that um, what you do have to be insulated from is um, you do have to be insulated by some of the criticism that comes with it and not in letting that uh, affect, you know, how you do things. And people, you know, I, I, you know, talk about that, uh, the saying of process over result. They're both important, you know, um, but you, if you stick to, um, you know, your, your process and, and knowing that um, I think, as you know, that that's always adjusting. It's not like, Oh, I'm just doing it this way. And like always and forever. It's like, no, we're always changing. We're always adapting. We're always going to figure out the best way, but knowing that you're giving it your best. I think that some, the reason why I'm able to deal with it is I know how much I put into it. Um, and, and to all phases of our organization. And then if something go, doesn't go down in a big moment, you know, and it, and obviously our big moments happen, happen mostly in front of a lot of people. Yeah. You know, they happen in front of a lot of people is if it doesn't go down, making sure you take full ownership um, and not being defensive or insecure. Um, it's just being able to look someone in the eye and man to man or woman to woman and just saying, hey, you know, this is this was my thought process and it didn't go down. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and I'm going to try and do better the next time, you know, but uh, I don't think that you can run from from tough moments. It's just part of sports. I think as a competitor, one thing that you have to have some acceptance of is that there are going to be some really tough moments and you have to be ready for them because the, yeah. the great moments they kind of handle themselves is it's, I think you got to be at your best when it doesn't go down. Um, and that's what I've tried to do in my first year. And, and I know that I'll keep getting better as I go. Well, I love one of the, one of the things I admire about you coaches, uh, I can see like the competitor in you and I love how you like channel that into coaching, but I'm a little bit interested as a former player, how you learn to channel that into coaching. Like it's really easy as a player, like the competition's right in front of me. Like I got to beat this guy right next to me, but yeah. in other jobs where it's not as physically demanding or mono we mono or like there's winners and losers every day. Yeah. Like how you keep that mindset of like, it starts with competing against yourself, obviously, and being yes. the best best version of yourself. But how how did you like learn to channel that in the arena of coaching? I think it's awesome question. I love the way you started. It, it starts with me versus me. Um, I've always been that way. Um, you know, I know what I'm capable of, and making sure I'm living up to that because uh, you know that that gear you have inside of you. So you have to live up to that. Number one, you know, and so that's always important for me. But then, I think um, what's what really inspired me to coach was I love players and I've always felt like I'm competing with my players. Um, 
And I think that, and for my players, I've always wanted to look, you know, players to see me as their teammate. Um, and I think that the way you do that as a coach, um, you show your competitiveness every time you're in front of them. You show, there's a, there's a saying that I'm really fond of, which is like, be everything you want your players to be. And I think that um, I like always try to live up to that. And so like, if you consider yourselves a competitor, okay, if I do, then I'm going to make sure that my players see that. They don't need to hear me say it. They're going to see that. They're going to see how prepared I am. They're going to see how detailed I am. They're going to see the level of purpose that I have. Um, and I'm not going to have to tell them that I'm a competitor. I'm going to show them. And I feel like on a day-to-day -day basis, like there's nothing more sacred than earning an NFL player's respect. And every time you get in front of an NFL player, you have that opportunity. And when you look at it that way, you're going to prepare a certain type of way. And that's long before you get to the game, you know, and then that's a separate story. But like every single day, I'm showing an NFL player the type of competitor I am, you know, and I think that that's really, really important, um, the way they see me on a day-to-day -day basis. And then when we're at the game, um, you know, then I think we're all in the arena together you know, and, and then we know what it is and we know what's at stake and we know who we're going against. Um, but I've always felt like as a coach, um, that it's so important that the players see you as a competitor. And, and I think that that's something that, uh, you know, that I take a lot of pride in and that I'm, I'm hoping to prove every single day. I think, uh, for you and I, maybe it's, it's easy maybe easier for me to channel that competitiveness. I talked about the mano y mano, but maybe I think you can relate to this because you went through a season in your life when you were diagnosed with cancer, but maybe some people were like in a limbo season. Yeah. And it's like, man, I don't even know what tomorrow's going to hold. Right. Talk a little bit about like that season of your life when you were diagnosed with cancer and I guess the unknown of it and like not knowing what the future held. And I'm sure you still had these dreams of like becoming a coach, but did those kind of like fall back? Well, I think the, the microscope and the telescope were at uh, play at the same time. I felt like when I got diagnosed with cancer, I was in kind of a, were you still playing or you, no, you I just, just got, out of I just got done playing and it was my first year in coaching. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of, I was kind of in transition, you know, it's okay. I'm transitioning from a player to a coach and a, you know, from a, you know, whatever, from a college guy to a professional. And it was interesting because it's almost like cancer came at a perfect time for me because that first year um, in coaching, it was very different for me. Um, that I think that transition from playing to like whatever's next, that was, that was tough for me. And even though I loved football and I, I wanted to be a coach so desperately, it definitely was not the same as playing. OK, and certainly being the starting quarterback to then go into the very bottom of a profession, that was a very different, you know, um, I think feeling. Uh, and I think what cancer did for me was it, it, it just it brought out the purpose in me, the competitor in me. It gave me something um, to really attack, something that would challenge me and bring out the best in me. What was that purpose for you that you're, you're talking about there? I think that um, it just... I think there was a time after I got done playing where, all right, how am I measuring myself? What am I going against? And then, you know, you, you face something like cancer. Now you know exactly what you're up against, you know, and you know, you know, because I had a lot of experience with it with my parents both going through it. Um, I knew kind of the gravity of, of that situation. And, and I knew that it was going to be a chance for me to, to show what I was made of. I knew that. Like, I was like, okay, how I compete versus cancer is going to show people what I'm made of. And then what I didn't, what I wasn't able to predict was when I got to the other side of it, I wasn't able to predict like that feeling, that confidence um, that it was going to bring out in me. And, and I feel like once I, once I got past my cancer stuff, that is when I had like an explosion of where I was going and how I was going to get there. You know, I knew where I was going and how I was going to get there. And that's when I met Amy um, and I was, I was at that best version of myself. I was headed that way. And I feel like that's what brought us together because, you know, I wasn't trying to be someone I wasn't. I knew exactly what I was going to do and how I was going to do it. And I feel like that's what led me to her. Did and you lack that confidence before cancer? I don't think so. I think the confidence was different. I think, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't have that sense of 
how I was going to do something that wasn't playing. I mean, I knew how to become the starting quarterback. I knew how to become a good student. Like I, you know, that's how I was engineered. Hey, be a good player, be a good student, you know, and that's kind of your life for whatever, 12, 13, 14 years growing up. I don't think I had a great idea of how I was going to be a great professional, you know, and I think that, and then when I say a great professional, great professional, and then, hey, a father and a husband someday, you know, how I was going to do that, you know, and um, once I got done with cancer, I knew exactly how I was going to do that. I knew exactly how I wanted to do that. And, um, and I, and I think Amy would tell you the same thing. My twin brother, my younger brother, my dad, they would tell you that, that I I came out of that different in a, in a great way. What was the way when you say that's the way I wanted to do things? Like, what was that for you? I would say that way, like, um, explained easily is like serving others and just not living my life for myself, you know, living my life for other people. And Hey, if you want to go be a coach, um, then you want to be a teacher. And you know that you're not doing that for yourself. You know mm. that you're doing that for other people. And and I knew that, uh, you know, there's a big responsibility that came with that. And you got to live your life a certain way in order to earn that mantle of being a coach or a yeah. leader. And um, and then also, you know, someone that was going to hopefully have a family someday and what that was going to mean. Mm-hmm. And so I think I just was headed in uh, a much different direction in a great way. And uh, I don't think that that would have happened um, without cancer. All right, I know we're running up against our time, but uh, one thing I do is I do a little Q&A. So I'll post mm-hmm. a little thing to Twitter and then everybody can kind of like put their own questions in. And I, sure. I pull some of those. Um, a lot of questions about uh, DJ. They love to talk about DJ on there, uh, <laughs> rightfully so. Um, but I got four here. So let's start out with the first one. It said, uh, this guy asked, what's your mindset when you're making a, a critical decision in the game? I guess what's your process a little bit? Is it... Uh, I guess, is it consulting the stat guys? Are you more of like an intuition, like gut guy? I think uh, what I would describe it easily is mindset and math. You know, like we have a mindset. Mindset and math. You know, like your mindset is first, um, and then the math is second, uh, I think, when it comes to football. And uh, I think both of those things are happening at the same time, but it really starts with a mindset. Uh, and then you go to, you know, the probability, you know, the, some of the math, the stuff that you and I know, tendency, scattering report, who you're playing against, all that, where you're playing, all that factors in. But I think it really starts with your mindset um, and then using the facts on the ground um, to kind of confirm, you know, what you're feeling. Has there ever been a time where you're like, the math is saying do this, but you feel so strongly in your gut and you're like, yeah, I'm going with my gut. Yeah, it happened uh, a lot. Um, it happened it, 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 a it, lot. It, it happened a lot last year, but it, it's happened, you know, throughout my whole life. I think, um, you know, I think last year, uh, you know, I think the Cincinnati game kind of comes to mind on that first drive. Um, you know, that was a big game for us. We were coming off a really tough loss against Denver. We really had to win that game. Had to win that game. And they were a good team. They were having a good season. Um, and we went down there on that first drive and had a really good drive going, you know, Dre had the first, the first kickoff return that was awesome. And, you know, it was a tough environment. I think that that, that team and that stadium felt like they were going to win that game. Um, and when we went down there, I was like, you know, kicking a field goal here is not going to be good enough for us, you know? And, uh, you know, we, we, you know, Justin hits that fourth down and four, you know, to Keenan, um, he fits that thing in there. And, you you know, I remember in that team meeting showing you guys how tight that window was. But I really felt like in a game that you got to have, you got to have that mindset of we're coming here to win. We're not coming here to, like, hopefully figure this thing out. Mm -hmm. Like, we're coming here to win and we're going to be able to deal with it. That was one that stood out to my mind where um, it was a mindset game for us. All right. People want to know about your pregame stare routine. Oh, yeah. That's that's just an op to – to compete against to, yourself, to, to compete, uh, to look good, to feel good. Um, you know, I, I started it when I was in Chicago and, uh, actually Jay Rogers, who's our D line coach now, Jay and I kind of started together. And, um, it's again, it's just as a, as an NFL coach, you know how busy it is. It's just another way for me to, uh, be able to get a workout in. And also it gets me in a good place. I think as a competitor, you know, like yeah. you get that sweat going and like, Hey, all right, now, hey, I've accomplished something that I like, and then it kind of gets you in that 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 rhythm and in that headspace that hey, we gotta we gotta compete. Today. Is there a SoFi benchmark 
where you go in on Sunday, you're like, I know I did it in this time last. So time. I got this I'm Strava app. I got it. this Strava app, you know, that, that we've got, that's going to measure, you know, how fast you go and, and all that, you know, uh, so I'm a part of that. So I can measure how fast I ran and like, we're kind of links you up to your brother who's on a similar app. And so he finishes and he knows exactly what my time was. And, um, you know, if it was a tough stadium run, like, Hey, you know, maybe you go to Buffalo or something like that. It's a really tough course. Um, you know, but it's just another way to measure yourself. And I think, uh, again, get you in the, get, get you in that arena like everybody else. All right. Um, we'll go last question here. Where do you see Derwin making the biggest jump in his game this year? Man, there were um, no questions about my jump in my game. They all want to know about Derwin. Well, I can answer that. I can answer. I can <laughs> no, answer no. that both ways. Um, no, we're going Derwin. I think uh, DJ, um, as you know, is is such a fantastic player. Um, I think that um, because he can do so many things, um, I think sometimes where you suffer a little bit is when you can do so many things. Is like, can you get? Can you master the fundamentals of all those things? And I think that Derwin can become a more technical player. He's such a, he's like a force of nature, as you know, and in many ways, just physically, but then his mindset, such a fierce competitor. But then there's like, I think, you know, the aesthetics of becoming like kind of that poetry in motion as a, as a player where he can really improve the technical aspects of his game. And I think being a full year in our system and full year of our fundamentals, he can become a master of that. I know how important that is to him. Um, is for it to be aesthetically pleasing, you know, to him, for him to be able to see like, Hey, that is the perfect technique mm. of that place. And I think, um, he's had a really good off season so far that way. And I'm excited to see him. Hey, we, we, we we've slashed a three off his Jersey. He's got a single digit. He's going to be lighter. He's going to be lighter. He's going to feel a little bit different and he's going to be a little bit more fundamentally sound. So I'm excited to see what that looks like. Let's go. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're a busy man. Thanks for having me, man. This has been awesome. This has been great. Can't wait to see you tomorrow morning. Yeah, I'll see you tomorrow morning. Uh, I think we have uh, Cavs and Spurs. We do. We have a little dollar. Don't give it away any secrets. Um, But yeah. They don't know. They don't know what that is. They don't know what that is. But uh, we do. We do. We do. All right. Sweet. Thanks a lot, Drew.